There we go. Amal, what's going on? Thanks for joining tonight. How we doing? How we doing? Oh, you just connected to audio. I see. There we go. So Hello. Can you hear me? Hey, yeah, there we go. There we go. I hear you now. How are you, Brendan? I'm great. Great. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. It's very late here, but it's all right. I'm sure. I, what what time is it exactly? Like one forty. One forty. Oh my goodness! I'm sorry to have you on that. No, it's all right because I do night shift. Oh. I normally do night shift, so that's okay. Okay, gotcha. Where where are you located right now? If if I'm allowed to to ask. I'm a nurse. And and where where are you located? Where what what country? What? Have you ever heard of a city called Bristol? Bristol, London. Yes. Of it's course. Three of course. hours away from Bristol, uh, London. Oh, excellent! Oh, cool. So you're in London. Awesome. No, no, I don't live in London. I mean, it's three hours away from London. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand, but like, like near Bristol, near London, yeah. So, but but you're in the in the UK. What I mean is not not like somewhere else in the world. So I I, I have an idea now. <laughs> ah, yes, yes, yes. That's right. That's right. Excellent, excellent. And so, um, you said you're you're a nurse. Yes, registered nurse. Wonderful, wonderful. And let me just give you a shout out. Your handle on Instagram is. The or for the love of medics and medics is spelled M E D I X. Awesome. Yeah, medicine, short for medicine. Right, 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 right. For medicine. Cool. How how's the day going? My day has been great. Thank you. How's your day as a residency? Good, good. It's been it's been a busy couple of months, especially this week. We have a big surgery that in a little bit, once we kind of conclude, I gotta get ready for it tomorrow. It's gonna be repair of a bunch of a bunch of facial fractures actually and obviously i got to come prepared with you know brush up on the subjects and topics but um yeah we so we had talked a little bit on on instagram in the direct message about just having a discussion of kind of how to know what profession or how how like when do you know something is the right profession to you for you rather than just guessing or whatnot yes so for example when I first saw your social media, I noticed how passionate you talk about your after day to day shifts, like your patience, the anatomy of the jaw and the teeth. And I can tell how devoted you are into this field compared to me. You know, I'm a nurse. I just go in and go out. And I don't love my job. I just do it because I have to. Mm. And, um, I had to double check your LinkedIn and it's like a 10 whole year of dedication of Max Fox, which is amazing. And um, so my question is, how do you know Oma Fest is the right career for anyone? And it's not a face because I was interested in this field and I was like, I'm not sure if it's a field. Sure, sure. I, yeah. What was that? And I feel like you're the right person to ask this question. Well, thank you. I, and I appreciate that. The first thing I would say is, you know, social media, especially in times of rules and privacies and protection, there's only so much, for example, my, speaking to myself personally, there's only so much I can reveal, if you will, or talk about what goes on in the hospital setting and then residencies and then at academic institutions that have a lot of rules, you know what I mean? A lot of compliancy guidelines. And so I have to stay within those boundaries, right? And so while some may look at my content that are maybe other oral surgeons, say in the United States that have have some idea of what residency is like, they're also, they also would probably look at it and say like, this is just so simplified and such dumbed down material, if you will, because I use layman's terms and talk like that. But you know, the fact is there's only so much you can talk about. And also social media is, you know, the pool of oral surgeons in the, in the United States compared to like the general population is maybe the pinpoint like a, of a dot, right? Versus like the general public's understanding, knowledge. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar, but, you know, the average 
reading and understand reading comprehension and just general understanding level of language of a human being is about a seventh grade reading level. And that was of 10, 20 years ago with the rise of shortened attention spans and, and such. And I know this is kind of like a roundabout answer, but we'll get to it. It TikTok, social media, instant gratification, Netflix giving you more of what you like, TikTok especially, their algorithm hones on that completely. But I, I would argue that the attention span has gotten even lower. So that's the reason for layman's terms and simplification of stuff. But what I would say to you is there's so much that goes on in a residency and any career, whether it's your career or my career, you know, everyone has the ups and downs. And, you know, I try and highlight, I try to highlight some of the things I enjoy looking back on in the day or the week or what happened recently, you know, stuff like that. So I appreciate your kind words, but you know, you have to take it with a grain of salt because that's of course, a little of bit course, of actually yes. what goes on, whether it's for better or for worse. Right. And I'm sure I'll have more, more details to reveal after graduating, but now, okay. So that being said, let's get into just the topic of how do you know something's right for you? I really think it comes down to just exposure, right? Well, there's, there's one, there's knowing yourself, right? There's knowing what you like to do, your interests, knowing what you're good at, what your talent is, if you will, what you're skilled at, what comes to you instinctually and naturally, right? And then there's, and what you're interested in, right? Like knowing yourself. And then there's knowing what you're capable of, right? Like I really like to play basketball. It was my favorite sport growing up, played in college a little bit. I was never going to the NBA. As much as I wanted to tell myself <laughs> how many hours I could dribble the basketball or shoot, right? I was never going to the NBA. And so, you know, it's a really conversation of self-awareness. You really need to know yourself. You really need to know what excites you when you wake up in the morning. And just so now for me personally, I recognize that between playing basketball growing up, playing the violin growing up, um, I, I recognize I, I had pretty decent hand skills at some point. And I, I like talking with people. Obviously, I'm talking your ear off right now. I'm sorry for that. going to try and answer. That's okay. That. Honestly, it's all right. <laughs> well, thank you. And I like working with people. I really like to connect with people. And I really like to, you didn't get to see it, but um, I, I actually, I don't think I've talked about this, but on the Riverside podcast app, I love to get on and, and just converse, right? The phone is away. I'm not re looking, you know, it's disconnect from reality. And like, it's our conversation right now. It's protected. I love that. Um, the, the studio, if you will, of the podcast app, that's what that was that you said is blocked in in the UK, unfortunately, I call it the round table. The round table concept is because, and I know this is another tangent, but the round table concept came from the middle ages where they would get all like the Lords and medieval Kings and whatnot all together to discuss business and politics and whatnot. But it was a round table because everyone had an equal portion at uh, to, to speak at that table at that time. And I really appreciate that when connecting with people. Right. And I've actually right. been, quite surprised and appalled, if you will, at the amount of other people that don't really look at things that way and have had a little amount of exposure to true team environments. Um, that being said, I think it comes down to self-awareness. You need to get, you need to get a good gauge and you only do this by just asking yourself questions, giving yourself perspectives. I love to listen to like Ted talks and podcasts and stuff. You get such a good perspective of other people's beliefs and values and their own perspective. Right. I think that's right. important so that you could kind of question yourself and be like, hmm, do I look at things that way? Do I believe that's true? Do I agree with that? No, I don't agree with that. Why? Why do you not, you know, and having the ability to be able to talk to other people that don't have the same views or values or perspectives as you, right? That's very important too. So now getting into the exposure, as far as dentistry goes, I was looking to go to med school, maybe nursing, maybe PA, uh, phys physician assistant, now physician associate. Um, getting exposure to these things, right? Seeing that's my, my, uh, my air conditioning. Sorry. They finally turned it on today. It's it's been so nice. <laughs> um, getting exposure, shadowing or observing doctors in the hospital, nurses, when they're on the job, PAs, when they're working, um, uh, getting in the OR, if you can get the, it's very hard to get the approval to be given the opportunity to go in the OR, very difficult, but do it. If you can, I met a bunch of dentists at the gym that I went to when I was growing up and they were like, while you're shouting the doctors, studying for the MCAT, come see, come come to my office, come see what we do. Let me know what you think. Maybe take the DAT and go go from there. Um, I really enjoyed it. I liked general dentistry. I loved oral surgery. 
got into dental school, went through all the hula hoops and up, up the hills and down the valleys. And, um, I kept my, my eyes open to other specialties. I, I kind of enjoyed orthodontics, not going to lie. Most oral surgeons say, oh, it's too easy. Oh, it's too simple. No, no, no. It, it's a pretty great lifestyle. Let's, let's not let that go by. And you know, it's a clean profession. There's nothing invasive. Um, it's, it can be predictable if you really understand the concepts and theories behind orthodontics, right? Um, but you need to get exposed to it. I got exposed to that a bit in dental school and it between pediatrics, between kids, orthodontics, straightening teeth, um, and other root canals with endodontics, it really just kind of steered me toward, I, I really enjoyed surgery more than anything else. Um, and that's where I went and I strove for it and I got it. Now I want to kind of, let's, let's get back to conversation. I don't, I don't mean to just project, but I want to, you know, make this more engaging. What, what are your thoughts on that? And tell me about your, maybe let's, let's backtrack. What about your understanding of your self-awareness? What do you like to do? What makes you most excited on any random day? Maybe a Saturday, right? You have the weekend off, let's say, what makes you most excited for your day ahead? Um, apart from hobbies, are you talking about career vision? Everything. What I like to do is wake up, go for a walk, go to Pilates, cooking, sewing. Uh, yeah, those are my main hobbies. But I like to, what you just said, I like to do things for my hands. Mm -hmm. And it, I was thinking about anesthetics, but it's not my vibe. I feel like oral is my vibe, but I'm not sure if there's a phase, but I need to expose myself into that field. Exactly. I don't know. Are you familiar? The CRNA, which is the Certified Registered yeah. Nurse Anesthesiologist. I don't know. Does that exist in the UK? Do you have that? Um, we call it uh, Anesthetics uh, Associates here, Assistant. But, oh, um, Brendan... I've got a call, so I'm going to come back two seconds, okay? Okay. Two seconds, really sorry. Sure. All good, all good. We're back, we're back. Yeah, so we're let's back. let's continue, let's continue. And then I got to eat dinner and get ready for tomorrow. But but yeah, so, so tell me more about your interest in wanting to work with your hands. Your actual pathway to getting to, you said, the anesthetic associate yes but brendan let me tell you something do you know the way you were saying about nba yeah 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 um it's kind of similar similar here if you want to become a omfs every mm -hmm. two people get accepted so it's very competitive Yes, it, it is very competitive. <laughs> yes, it's very competitive and it's like very impossible. It's like similar to neurosurgeon. Mm. It is. It's tough. Fortunately, that's just an obstacle that you have to defeat if you know that's what you want to do. That's true. That's true. But um, all I want to do is expose to myself in that area and see if I really love it. And if I do, I might try harder. But if I don't, I might just, you know, try something else. I think you just need to get exposed to more things. You know, it might be surgery. It might be anesthesia. It might be, you know, there's there, there are nursing roles in the hospital, especially here. I see it in New York, too. For nurses to kind of work their way up into administrative positions. So it's a lot less clinical and hands-on and much more overlooking other nurses, other departments, having a lot of administrative roles. Um, you get paid more. Sometimes you don't necessarily have better hours too. And another thing that this is a very important concept, understanding quality of life. And, you know, a lot of people think that doctors make so much money. Well, when they don't anymore, because the way inflation has gone versus like insurance reimbursement hasn't been balanced. It hasn't been equal. So doctors work the same, if not maybe a little more than they have previously, maybe about the same or maybe even a little less, but they get paid significantly less. 
And of that, the amount of ta- that the amount of that money that is taxed, and the amount that that money can actually do for you, right? Like what that money buys you now is is significantly less. So that's one thing. But if you look at the doctor's work hours, or even the nurses work, well, the ner- some nurses I know are only like three and a half, four days a week, which is outstanding, and they get paid yeah. more than I do as a resident. But I think the quality of life is really dependent on making sure that you have all your pieces in the day in a week in a month's time to do what you need you get to travel a certain portion of the year you you get enough peace of mind on a daily basis you know there are a lot of doctors that don't get that there are a lot of in many professions that don't get that and now if you're working 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 and this is what the point that i'm getting to sorry again for the tangent but i i thought it was going to be work hard play hard and i found out especially now this is residency specifically there's a lot of work and a lot of playing <laughs> <laughs> do you believe that concept work hard and play hard and you uh you it pays off at the end absolutely i believe that i haven't seen it yet in medicine that's the crazy part right i believe I... work hard play hard and so in and, and everyone plays differently you know what i mean some people love to paint some people love to cook some people really love to travel you know whatever the play is right it's not like going out and drinking a lot of alcohol at night that's not what i mean by work hard play hard i mean work hard and like have time to enjoy your life a little bit. But when you're, when you're working six days a week, three weeks a month, have one weekend off a month, two weekends off a month, throughout residency and such, and then you get so groomed into this, this mentality and expectation that you know, you're know you supposed to work a lot, you're a doctor. But then you finally become an attending and now you think you're, you're compensated adequately for the amount that you're working, but you're working so much more than the average person. Crazy so, hours. So the crazy, so that's that. And then you're paid significantly more than a resident, but not like, I don't know. Brendan, um, I want to ask you, guess how much, not doctor, but nurses here gets, just guess. Uh, I would, I would, I would probably think it's around maybe, uh, now I, I don't know what it would be, you know, in the UK, but. I would equate that to maybe around eighty thousand, eighty thousand dollars. No way, no way. Less than thirty k. Less than thirty k, and then how many days a week do you have to work? Six days, uh, five days. So, like a Monday through Friday kind of situation. Yes, twelve hours. Five twelve hour days. Yes, you just get thirty k dollars. Thousand dollars and uh, a year per annual. And then, how much do, do taxes take out of that? So after tax, maybe it would be twenty six, twenty five k, a year. Thousand pound, pound, yeah. Twenty six. So, so your own like only only four k goes to taxes. No, it depends. It depends. So uh, if you're working for, have you ever heard NHS? NHS, the National Health Society. No. Service, yes. Service, yes. Yes. So if you work with them, you naturally get 30K around that much. Pounds. I don't know dollars, but pounds. I'm going to ask ChatGPT right now, what is 30K Pounds in the UK um, converted to US dollars. Let's see. No, it's interesting. Let's see. It's saying currency. It's saying about weight of currency. <laughs> so that's about $42,000. So $30,000 is about $42,000. And you're saying so it goes it, from about 30,000 pounds. Minus taxes would be about 26. Okay, let me make it easier. So $15 an hour. $15 an hour. Okay. That's that's not much. That's not much at all. I, I know right now I'm making about 10 an hour compared to the hours I work. So but it it's similar. No, it's it's crazy. I know I know nurses make significantly more than that, at least starting out. Maybe not significantly, but they make more than that starting out. Now, and I don't think they're working as many days or hours as you. What do you think about that? 
Um, you mean the three days a week and they get much in America? Is that what you're trying to say? That they get more. Yes. Yeah. What what do you, what do you think about that? And how did the UK get like that? Wow, a lot of people are jealous and, you know, most people are flooding, they're just quitting, they, uh, they're working in McDonald's instead, because less stress, a lot of them, you know, they're working in uh, mm. retails, I even quit a lot of times, I said to myself, this is too much, it's not worth it, it's not uh, compensating uh, to us a lot of times, yeah. to be honest. It's so interesting. It, and it, it really is, it's an issue. It's a problem. I don't know what the answer is because, and then also healthcare in the UK is different, right? So like you get hurt, you go into the hospital, everything kind of gets taken care of, right? Yes, yes, it's free. It's free. Like, for example, if a bit ball just bit my face right now, I can go to the oral max facial for free. Mm. And Yes. then what is your surgeon reimbursed for that treatment would be, would be Um, interesting to see, you know, because it's all covered by the government, you know, the insurance of being a citizen and then it's covered by the, by the government. But if you, if you look at the history of government covering, you know, when they released, what is it? Medicaid, Medicare around 2008, they actually dropped the reimbursement fees that, than what all other insurance organizations were providing. So it allowed them to drop everything. And they haven't increased it basically since. So that just leads into what I'm saying is where it's like, we're working the same, more or less, but we're getting paid less over time. And of that being paid less, or paid the same, right? But there's more being taken out in taxes and the money of the money that you get, it works less for you, works less. Whereas like you could get two McDonald's, now, now you can only get one in 30 years. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's a trend that's kind of scary. And now in the UK, you go through that the tuition to become a doctor is much lower, right? Very low. Wow. We're very lucky. Very lucky, to be And honest. And, yeah. and after you graduate, you can pick a spot for residency in America if you, if you can afford it, you know? Right. Right. It's very. It used to be. Sorry. Sorry, Brendan. No, no, I'm just saying it, it's, it's striking the differences and, you know, like you go to the hospital here too, though, and you don't have insurance and you need an emergency, you're still getting taken care of, even if you can't pay for it. So it's not necessarily like you don't get what you need if you can't pay for it here. But so, yeah, as Wait, we, what was that? so what happens if a dog bits my face and I don't have health insurance? What happens? You go to the hospital. Yes. And what about if I don't have health insurance? So that is facial trauma, right? You'd go to most like a level one trauma center if it's depending on how macerated and how many, you know, how much facial trauma you have. Probably a level one trauma center. Uh, level one trauma centers are generally public institute. But bottom line, to cut to the cheat, you get treated, of course. Your face isn't just going to go home with an open bite in it, right? And then uh, who knows who pays for it? Wow. Wow. I'm shocked. Yeah. So like it's, it's all in all, it's not like you just can't get your face fixed here. That's not it. it it's, um, then I guess the taxes pay for it, you know, in, in theory. Right. Right. So for this, uh, conversation, for example, if someone wants to become a OMAX, uh, OMFS, surgeon and uh, here they have to go to instead of two year medical school they have to do five years medical school five years dental school and then they have to do their training residency so that's like a very lifelong journey That is for, so five and five. five and five and residency maybe six years Interesting. So have you ever seen a older person, maybe over 30 years old, 
who wants to become I'm not 30 by the way I'm way below so who wants to become a uh, maxillofacial surgeon yeah I actually have a co-resident who's 47 oh wow that's amazing yeah yeah it is it is quite amazing and impressive at, at, at such an age to still be as agile and and ready to go you know and feisty <laughs> uh no, no but um but no it what, what it, but in the UK, you go right from high school to either medical school or dental school, right? And then residency? Yes, that's correct. You Right. guys don't do it. You do undergrad. It, exactly. We do undergrads. So we go off and learn about differential equations and calculus for a couple of years, you know, we, we, <laughs> and then we go in, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's very interesting. So, so um, if I do want to uh, shadow... this oral surgeon field, do I have to just message them on LinkedIn, Instagram, where? I would start by talking with people in your network. So you're a nurse. Do you work at a hospital? Yeah, but now I work in a residential home. Residential Some home. with yeah, residential home. Do you know what that is? Like, Where all people are. uh, yeah, okay. Like an assisted living home. Yes. Yes. Got it. Is that the only place that you work? Sometime hospital, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. When you're at the hospital, that's where I think you'd want to look into your network. You'd want to look into the maxillofacial surgeons. You want to look into oral surgeons. I think in the UK, the oral surgeons generally go more dentistry and then maxillofacial surgeons are more medicine. And I could be way off. I, I don't know. I don't know the curriculum or the pathways, but it's really going to be looking because you're a nurse, you know, it's not like you're an IT person that does computer science all day. At least you're in the field, right? The general field. I would look, I would talk to everyone, you know, and see who knows a dentist, an oral surgeon, a maxillofacial surgeon and get in contact with them. Yeah. LinkedIn is one way I would really work in your network because the name thing was, oh, you know, Lorraine, I met Lorraine last week. She told me to talk to you. You might happen to know one of the surgeons in maxillofacial or oral surgery, you know, you know what I mean? I would use that network. Okay, that's very awesome. Yes, thank you very much, Brendan. Of course, of course. I got time for one more, one more topic. What, what would you want to dive into? Um, hang on, uh, let me check. Okay, so this is very sensitive. Hello? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay, this might be very sensitive, but the reason why I didn't get into dental school is because, you know, I'm not sure if this is true, but what's the reason why everyone says um, dentists has the highest suicidal rate? Is it even true? Oh, um, yeah, I think, well, it's, it's very interesting. This is a very interesting topic too. This, this, this is a, a big can of worms to open. They say like the, the expression for it, you see a lot of suicide rates, very high in medical professionals in general, especially doctors and dentists, very high lawyers as well. And you could, you could research that. In fact, let's pull it up on chat GBT. What are the top five career fields with or 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 professions with the highest suicide rates healthcare professionals number one Wow, and I'm i not I, surprised. wow so legal professionals is actually number four healthcare professionals is number one Physicians, nurses, and other healthcare workers often face high levels of stress, long hours, emotional strain, which can contribute to mental health challenge. I, I think that this is absolutely true. You know, you're constantly, especially, it's so interesting in today's day and age, the lack of, tr the level of the lack of trust that patients seem to have in providers is, is something we've never seen before. And I've talked with, with professionals in different areas of dentistry, medicine, and a lot have agreed. Some have disagreed. And they haven't really been exposed and working with patients as much as like directly with patients. Um, 
I would, I would definitely do that. I think it has a lot to do with the whole concept of like work hard, play hard right now. It's just kind of, or, or the other concept is, do you live to work or do you work to live? And I, I see every day, I was very disappointed with this when I started in the industry. I see everyone just kind of like studying and studying and studying. And it's like, what are you studying for? You're studying to treat patients, right? And then they go off and graduate dental school and they get married and they don't work a day in their life. And I'm like, you were the hardest studier in the class and now you're not even working. And like, what is your purpose then? You know what I mean? It was just to compete with other students until you wanted to start a family because you got married. I, I don't, I don't know. Men and women, like I, I saw it on both sides. It's not, you know, um, very interesting topics. But so I think the whole live to work, work to live is is very, very curious. Military personnel, it says the number two here. Number three is first responders, police officers, firefighters, emergency medical technicians. I, I would imagine military personnel and first responders has a lot to do with PTSD and trauma, right? Uh, combat stress and such. Uh, and then legal professionals, number four, and then farmers and agricultural workers is number five. I wouldn't be able to explain that. That I didn't expect. But yeah, so healthcare professionals, what do you think? Have you experienced hard, you know, emotional stress, hard work hours? And it sounds like you have. Um, now I'm experiencing that uh, I want to work for a passion, you know? Mm. Mm -hmm. I got into nursing because it's a feminine job and everyone uh, around me was getting into uh, nursing and the men were getting into doctor, medical field. That's the only reason. And I believe the only way you can be happy is to find uh, your true passion. And I also believe the highest paid specialties are the ones that you enjoy and can work for. 30 years and not get not get burned out i'm not sure if that's a true statement no I, I believe I, that i agree with that what you just said is spot on the one thing i would add to that though is you're basing it based off of the structure of salaries if you will you, like you said the ones that get paid this well who's paying them no no i know what you mean for example i interviewed this uh i know this guy he's a orthopedic surgeon Mm -hmm. And he loves what he does. But, for example, you cannot get into that field because of the money because you will get that type of money after 15 years. So you need to love that what you do. You do. Throughout that journey. Especially, so he's an orthopedic surgeon in the UK, correct? Yes. So who does he get paid by? <laughs> the government. The government, right? So... Yeah. That's where the salary comes from. I think the key in many instances, which was partially the reason I went into dentistry and not medicine, because in dentistry, it's changing. It's Everything's become very corporatized with this rise of inflation, as well as rise in certain taxes and interest rates and rules that kind of confine smaller businesses, which I think is the key to freedom, if you will. I really think it is. You mentioned you love cooking, you love sewing and Pilates, just for three examples. I think it would be outstanding and you would be, you would be thrilled every single day of your life if you could get up and do those three things and you were making money around it. Now, maybe not 30,000, right? Maybe not what your salary is now, but if you were to cut that in half and every day you could work, wake up and do what you want to do, I think that might be the key, right? And, may, and maybe that's maybe that's OMFS. Maybe that is the anesthesia associate or anesthesia assistant. Associate anesthetist, was that it? Yes, yes, you're correct. Right? Or, or maybe it's that. But just remember, like the more you do that, it's a paid position from someone else. Maybe it's the government, maybe it's the hospital, maybe it's the insurance company, right? But you're always, you're never getting paid by the person you're working for, you're working with, working with. You're getting paid by the person you're working for, which is not the patient, right? And therefore, there will always be an opportunity for that employer, whoever is paying you to kind of say, you know, we had to let this, if say you're, you're the associate anesthetist and another anesthesiologist or nurse, you know, a nurse or associate anesthetist left the job. They, you work for the, this company, hospital, organization, whatever it is, the, 
you work for them. They don't work for you. So they can turn to you and be like, look, this person left. We only have three on the team. Now we're down to two. You need to pick up additional hours. And you can't say yes or no to it because you work for them. You see what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. you could be doing what you love to the max, associate anesthetist. Say that's the number one thing you love. But now you're being worked more than is appropriate, right? Just based on your quality of life. And you have no say in that. So I do think yes and no. I, I do think for the most part, yes, of exactly what you said. But I think a very big portion is to make sure that you still have your own I wouldn't want to call it control, but that you have the power to determine and make your own decisions in a weekly, monthly, yearly basis. You know what I mean? Whether it's around your own interests, whether it's around your um, mental health state, whether it's around your family. Um, you got bit by a dog. You got to go bring your, your, your daughter got bit by a dog. You got to bring her, her to the hospital. You can't leave work because now you're only two that used to be three and that's the, who's going to cover for you. They got no one. You know what I mean? And this is a very simple example, but this is something I've noticed in the hospital setting. People leave, they take three months to start looking to replace that job. And who's got to pick up the slack and do all of that job. Everyone else around them and they don't get paid anymore. And over time, so that this is a short term, right? Someone leaves, everyone else around has to fill in for that role. Then they find someone else. And then this, this and that and sorts itself out. But over time, I'm talking decades, 20, 30 years, the hospital finds ways to, you know, we don't really, we're, you know, it's the 2008, you know, we're in a recession right now, maybe borderline depression. We don't really need to replace that person. Everyone else has figured it out. Things are functioning smooth. I don't have to do that job. They do, you know, like, unfortunately, these things we see in the hospital all the time, and I don't agree with it, but um, then the hospital saves money and people are doing more work for the same amount of pay. If you own your own business, this is what I'm getting to, you are able to have a lot more oversight and power to make the decisions that you feel is right underneath your roof, if you will. Right, right. Um, Brendan, have you ever asked yourself, would you ever work for free, what you do? I do a lot of work for free right now in residency. But in the future, would you ever work for free like two times a week if you had to? Would you do it? There has to be some form of compensation, whether that's not even financial reimbursement, right? I, I have some startups in the background that I'm slowly building over time, and I hope to do a lot more after graduating. But I do have a love for surgery, right? And there has to be some kind of purpose for it, right? Like, mm -hmm. I really like to meet people, and I really do like to make sure that I can take them out of pay and whatnot. Um. If it's just plainly for free, no money compensation, there's no like making friends through it, like it's very stressful. And, you know, people lose teeth, you're replacing things. There are complications in any medical field or specialty. Um, there needs to be some balance with, you know, there's, I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. I've never been asked that before. I like doing surgery. I want to do it minimum, maybe twice a week over the next 30 years. And I'm, I'm going to start out at five days a week, maybe in 10 years, I could go down to four days. We'll see how it goes. But like, 